that. So, um, right. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Ollie now. So Ollie, if you'd like to share your screen and uh, start us off. Thanks, Richard. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So uh, yeah, welcome everyone to the Greenpeace Bristol uh, Future of Transport talk. Thanks for sacrificing a bit of your Saturday afternoon uh, to be here. I've got the easy job of going first, so I don't have to uh, go after the other speakers because I know there'll be hard acts to follow. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to start my talk. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you guys will be able to see this little presentation. Okay, can everyone see that? Brilliant. Okay, so I'm just going to set the scene then. So why uh, Greenpeace are sort of interested and passionate about the future of our transport system. So Greenpeace is calling on the UK government to fix transport in the UK, making sure that everyone has affordable, accessible, safe and sustainable transport. Specifically, Greenpeace want the government to ramp up investment in public transport, walking and cycling, and to make sure that all new cars and motor vehicles, vans, etc., are electrical powered by 2030. And as Richard's already said, uh, we're coming at this from a national point of view, but we recognize there's lots of other groups and charities, NGOs out there, both on the national front and the local level that have been campaigning on uh, a better sustainable transport model for years and years. So this is just gonna give you a brief overview of what the problem is. So for, bear with me if uh, those people who are doing the talks later, you might be some overlap here. So our transport system isn't working. How do we know this? Towns and cities are clogged with traffic. Rail tickets cost a fortune, prices increase every year. The uh, major source of air pollution is from transportation. Car ownership and traffic uh, is rising. Uh, in 2007, there were 27 million uh, vehicles. Now uh, there's something like 38.3 million vehicles in the UK. And roads are plagued by potholes that have to be refilled every year. Not only that, but the poor transport options we have forces us to drive. Bus routes have been slashed, over 3,000 bus routes have been cut since 2010. And there are poor rail links to rural areas, uh, much up and down the UK. Fuel duty hasn't increased though for 10 years, but rail and bus fares, as I've already mentioned, get more expensive. So this really limits us to getting in our cars, and I'm sure many of us on this talk, myself included, own cars, because really to get to work and to go about our daily lives, we're sort of forced to in many of our towns and cities. So what has this all meant for the uh, CO2 emissions? So I hope everyone can see this graph because sometimes Zoom cuts out the top of it with that menu. So I'm just gonna read out what hopefully you can see at the top. It says change in CO2 emissions, 1990 to 2018. And you can see there's uh, two colored lines, a red and a yellow line. The red line represents road transport UK emissions and the yellow line is total UK emissions. And um, what this graph is showing is how much over time the transport uh, from across the whole of the UK 
uh, makes up the sort of greenhouse gases. As, so over time, the total UK emissions has gone down, but the emissions from transport are sort of flatlined. So emissions from roads, from cars hasn't really changed. And transport is still the single largest source of greenhouse gases. So what this is meaning for our environment is if we continue on the, the trend the UK government wants us to continue with, um, our emissions from transport isn't really changing that much. It's sort of flatlining a little bit. So in terms of the here and now with the pandemic, what has COVID-19 meant for the way we travel? Well, it's been quite a mixed bag. So I'm sure everyone would have noticed at the start of the pandemic, particularly when we're in the height of lockdown, um, things were a lot quieter. Um, the actual air that we breathed seemed a lot cleaner. I don't know if everyone saw those pictures from uh, India where in sort of the northern states, the Himalayas were visible for that brief time where previously they weren't. So the pandemic has brought about some positives like that. It's also meant more space for pedestrians because local councils have tried to pedestrianise high streets for social distancing. Bike sales have increased. So you could argue there's been lots of good things, but it's not as simple as that. Traffic has varied wildly. Working from home has meant there's been some uh, drop in traffic and rush hour. And that's meant maybe less people commuting, but traffic has since returned. Fewer people are also on public transport. So they're more likely if they are to go to work, they're more likely to drive. So whereas that early lockdown gave us a taste of what a quiet and idyllic transportation system could look like in the future, what quiet roads could look like, what safer roads could look like, things have changed, unfortunately. So not all of these changes have been positive. The government has started to take action and there has been in the last few years some increases in cycling infrastructure. But the problem that we're really facing now is the government still plans to spend billions of pounds on new roads. What that means um, in concrete terms is they want to create 4,000 miles of new roads. OK, it's 27 billion pounds in total over the next three years. And why do they want to spend all this money on new roads? Well, most space on the roads is taken up by cars. So they're envisaging that there'll be uh, more people, more drive, more people driving and using the roads in the future. But that's not the solution Greenpeace is calling for. We're arguing that the solution is to give people transport choices. A lack of decent public transport system is a major barrier for people to take the, the train and the bus. And when they've done studies, I think the Citizens Advice Service did this study to what were the major barriers for people getting a job and holding down a job full time. And it was a lack of decent public transport in major urban conurbations. So Greenpeace is arguing we need more public transport options, more investment. We also need to widen footpaths. We also need to create more cycle lanes. Local councils like in Bristol need to think about low traffic neighbourhoods where they make maybe a traffic free zone or limiting traffic to certain times of the day. And we need more electric vehicle charging points. And I know that can be a bit controversial, but you, there might be something later if uh, we've got time, we could talk about the end as well, how that can be part of the solution, because I know they're quite expensive up front, but electric vehicles can be sustainable if used over a long time. And more on that, hopefully later as well. 
So Greenpeace are arguing all of these solutions is what we need together. It's not just one fix. So the right kind of investment would help with our transport system. And in England, this means spending another £10 billion per year. So that was kind of a brief overview. So like I said, the pandemic is going to be everyone's most important issue for quite a, a while, and rightly so. But we can't neglect this. Transport is an, also another issue, another area of our lives that's been affected more than most. And the day-to-day -day challenge of getting where you need to go safely has been made a lot more difficult. And this disruption might last for many, many more months. And the changes we've seen in the short term, like fewer people on public transport, as well as more space for, space for pedestrians in some areas and these wildly varying traffic levels means that investing in new roads surely can't be the only answer. So I hope today um, this talk and the rest of the talks will give you a bit more of a, of a, a shared kind of understanding about this issue and you'll help support our campaign on calling on the UK government to invest in more public transport and more sustainable transport options for everyone. So thanks very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thanks Ollie and uh, we're going to go straight on now and I'm going to invite uh, Lindsay to um, give her talk. So Lindsay is speaking on behalf of Liverpool Neighbourhoods and uh, without further ado Lindsay. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, I'll just get up and running with my presentation. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Lindsay Melling. I am part of the campaign of Liverpool Neighbourhoods for Bristol. Uh, I'm also the chair of my local active travel group, St George Active Travel. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, one of the solutions uh, to some of the problems that Ollie's just been going through there. Uh, and that's this concept of uh, livable neighbourhoods and what that is and how it could option uh, uh, be one of the options that could help us get out of that hole that we're currently in. Uh, so uh, luckily, uh, another campaign group have put together a great little video that will take us through what livable neighbourhoods are so that uh, they can explain it better than I can. Oh, um, livable neighbourhoods are uh, residential streets and areas where through traffic is discouraged uh, and other types of uh, modal uh, traffic like cycling, walking, but also uh, wheelchairs, uh, uh, scooting, all those lovely non-car based uh, modes of transport are encouraged. Uh, we do that by putting in modal filters, uh, the idea being that you're filtering out the motor traffic, but allowing through uh, the active travel. Um, so it's actually a very cheap and easy way of uh, making places nicer to live and nicer to travel through, uh, and whilst encouraging people within those places to travel more actively as well. 
So uh, let me give you an example of some of these modal filters uh, that we're talking about. So uh, like the video said, they can be bollards. Uh, in this case, we've got a, a very beautiful one with some planters in with some uh, nice trees and things as well. Uh, they can also be uh, what bus gates. Uh, many of you living in Bristol uh, will know about the bus gates that they've put in the centre now on Bristol Bridge. Uh, and Baldwin Street, uh, which allow through the uh, taxis, buses, motorbikes, etc., uh, but stop people in private cars. So there is kind of like a different levels of what your, your modal filter can be. It can be kind of fully permeable to certain types of traffic, or it could be much more of a, uh, a permanent option like this. Um, you can have options which allow through emergency vehicles, for example, as well, like uh, lockable bollards or crumple bollards as well. Um, so what are the benefits of a livable neighborhood? Well, um, cleaner air, uh, the streets can tend to be quieter and more peaceful uh, because people aren't cutting through those areas. I live on a, no a notorious rat run in St. George uh, where people are basically cutting the corner off uh, going from the north of the city to the west. And it just uh, having a modal filter in there or a, a livable neighbourhoods approach applied would mean that um, we would instantly have no speeding, less pollution, make it much easier for children uh, to be able to scoot and walk to school, make it much easier for people to be able to cycle through to get to and from work. Um, now, this has already been done. Uh, in various places. Uh, the Netherlands have been doing it for years. Uh, various councils have been doing uh, smaller versions, not calling it livable neighbourhoods for years. So you'll see mod modal filters while you're out and about. But Waltham Forest has really done it on a big scale. Uh, about uh, five or six years ago, I think, uh, they basically went on a whole scale uh, project to change their entire uh, area. And they put in uh, lots of bollards, lots of bus gates, uh, and the result of that is they've actually increased the life expense expectancy within Waltham Forest by between seven and nine months just in that time. Uh, and I can, uh, yeah, so basically uh, it's dramatic reductions in traffic volume and speed. Um, but it's not just about uh, taking those cars that used to drive through the area and just pushing them onto other areas. Um, it's also about getting people out of those cars and changing to other modes of transport. This is because uh, whereas uh, when you were traveling from A to B before, you would just go the shortest possible route and it might take you five minutes. So those are those really short car journeys, which are a big problem. The ones that are under five miles. Uh, once you've put a modal filter in the way and now you can still get to your destination but you have to go like uh, on a much wider route and maybe it takes you 20 minutes to get there now suddenly jumping on your bike and getting there in 10 to 15 minutes becomes a lot more attractive um, and actually the um, in Waltham Forest when they did this and they uh, looked at the traffic volume in the entire area, not just including Waltham Forest, but on the surrounding roads as well, they found that traffic went down by 15%. So uh, it's not even just good for the people in living in the area, uh, it's good for the surrounding areas as well because you're literally taking those cars off the road. And the other benefit is uh, the more you do it and the wider scale you do it, the more those benefits increase. So, uh, yeah. Um, I can actually show you a picture, uh, two pictures from Waltham Forest here. Uh, the first uh, is on the same street as the second. As you can see, they had a, a bit of a problem with speeding traffic and people causing accidents. In that same area today, uh, children can play and it's a pleasant place to be. Uh, one of the other benefits uh, that uh, people talk about as well is um, the Apple Yard study. And some people might have heard of this and some haven't, but it's uh, basically a study that was done back in the 70s uh, where they looked at uh, the social connections that people make within their streets. Um, on streets where there was a lot of high traffic, they found that there was a lot, lot less connections. People were talking to their neighbours less. They were going around. They weren't just stopping in the street and having a conversation. Whereas in uh, streets that were a lot quieter, you were having those social connections and people actually had much closer and better relationships with people in their local community. 
Um, an example of this would be on my road, where at the moment, every time I stop outside and my neighbour's coming out and we try and have a conversation, we're shouting above the traffic and it's not very nice and we move on. And I don't know people are very far up and down my street because we're kind of cut off by, by this constant stream of noisy traffic. It doesn't feel very safe either. So reducing the traffic actually helps people to uh, make better social connections and help with loneliness and things like that, which we know are bigger problems now. Uh, so I've been talking a lot about residential locations, but this can actually work quite well in places like high streets as well. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, people tend to enjoy being in uh, lower traffic areas when they want to go shopping, they'll spend more time there. Uh, it's actually been shown that uh, in places where there has been pedestrianisation, this is quite a wide ranging study, footfall goes up by around 32% and retail turnover goes up by 17%. Now, a lot of retailers, especially on high streets, which currently are highly trafficked, will feel that uh, a lot of their customers are coming from people who are, who are driving in, parking right outside their shop, coming in, doing their shopping, getting back in their car and going. Often that's uh, perception is much higher than the reality in terms of how many people are actually doing that. Um, even before you start off with all the customers they're missing out on because they're not going to that high street because it's not a nice place to go. Uh, people tend to spend a lot more money in somewhere where it's pleasant to sit and shop and go to different places and things like that. So uh, yeah, it can have a really good benefit for retailers as well. About a minute, Lindsay, please. Thank you very much. So what could this look like in Bristol? Well, I'm glad you let me know, Richard, because uh, this is my favourite bit. I can show you some pictures of how this could look uh, in our city. You might recognise this Cotton Hill. Uh, we've got uh, a, a good artist impression of some of the traffic goes up and down here. This is what it could look like. We could have places to sit, places to eat and drink, still letting through uh, people who are travelling actively, but stopping uh, the car traffic. I've got another one uh, down on uh, North Street. It's just off North Street. Uh, again, uh, lots of parking, lots of people taking up the space even when they're not driving around. Let's put a modal filter in there. Let's make that a beautiful place for people to actually sit and spend time and spend some money and enjoy being there as well as uh, actually making it the, the choice to travel actively the logical one rather than the illogical one it is at the moment. So what's our ask? Um, we have a, uh, basically we want the whole of Bristol to commit to putting in uh, livable neighbourhoods across the whole city. Now this could be done in a staggered way. Uh, there might be some uh, areas which would be pilot it and then roll it out wider, but we would want a commitment uh, to have a livable neighbourhood approach to the whole of Bristol. Uh, so that's what we're asking people to commit to in their manifestos. Uh, I'm just going to skip a couple of uh, uh, things just to take it forward a bit and just let you know that we have uh, 19 livable neighbourhood uh, Facebook groups. So you, wherever you live in the city, there's a Facebook group for you that you can join. Uh, we're trying to go from a ground up uh, kind of campaign, we're trying to get people to think about their uh, area and what they want for that uh, and then kind of bring all those voices together to, to uh, ask, ask the council to do this. Uh, we also have a change.org petition, which I can share the link to uh, in the chat in a minute uh, if you want to sign up for that as well. Uh, and yeah, this is us. Spread the word. Join our working group. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. I hope I didn't go too far. Oh, over no, there. that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, so thanks. Thanks so, so much, Lindsay. Uh, we have now been joined by... Um, Bristol North West MP Darren Jones. Darren, I can't actually see you at the moment, but I know you're there somewhere. I am. Hello. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Hi, Darren. Do you have um, some slides or anything, or do you just want to talk? I'll just talk, if that's all right. Okay. Yep. Yeah, you've got about 10 minutes, if you could. And then uh, if you are you able to stay on for the questions and answers at the end or not? I can do a few questions afterwards. I, I might not speak for the whole 10 minutes and then free up some okay. time to do that, if that's OK. OK, what we might do then, because Darren is going to... What we've said is for the other speakers that we're going to take all of the questions at the end because a lot of them apply across. But if anyone's got any questions specifically for Darren, if they could type them in and say for Darren and then the question, 
uh, Darren will try and answer those when he's finished speaking. Okay. Thanks, Darren. The floor is yours. Thanks, and sorry it's been a nuisance. The, the only clock I'm up against are my two children who are napping. And as soon as they wake up and start climbing on me, you'll know that I've timed out. But it's, um, it's a pleasure to be with you um, this afternoon. And thank you for organising this event and for the um, invitation. Uh, it may not come as a surprise to you that um, uh, certainly pre-COVID, if you were to um, uh, rank uh, the priority of issues that my constituents raise with me in Bristol Northwest on local issues, um, transport is number one. Um, uh, and has been ever since my election, and I'm sure longer uh, than, than my time in office uh, as the MP for Bristol Northwest. And so in 2018, we, um, uh, we orchestrated something called the North Bristol Transport Plan, which essentially was a way for us to talk with constituents across the whole constituency about transport and to try to understand what the key issues were that people were experiencing and how that affected them in their local um, uh, communities and what they wanted to be seen uh, to be done about it. And the reason for that is that as an MP, on this issue, I kind of have uh, two jobs, really. One is to understand uh, as best as possible what my constituents would like and what they wouldn't like. And that's sometimes a very contentious issue. Um, and I might come back to some of the, my experiences through that uh, in a few moments. And then my second job is to figure out how do we get things delivered. Now, as a member of parliament, I don't have any particular power or budget to do things, but my job is to try to persuade those people that do to, to do the things that we'd like them to do. Um, and again, I'll come back to that in a second. So in the North Bristol Transport Plan, there were um, uh, there, there were some key bits of feedback, didn't matter where you came from in the constituency, whether you were in Shirehampton and Lawrence Weston or in Henleys or in Lockleys, um, people wanted more reliable transport um, uh, that was running more frequently and that was more affordable. Um, so essentially, I think I've got some of the highest car ownership density in the city still in Bristol Northwest. Um, and that's primarily because for many people, if they try to get a bus, for example, um, they, they either come once an hour and if they're late, they're then late. And sometimes buses are just canceled at a whim um, and they can't go about their days. Um, or they don't have uh, an easy way to get to local rail connections. Um, so that was the first issue. And the second issue um, was around um, commuter traffic um, because Greater Bristol is growing at quite a speed uh, and that's going to keep growing because we know from uh, government nationally that the targets for house building um, are um, high in South Gloucestershire um, and parts of Bath and North East Somerset. And I think um, in North Somerset too, in Bristol, we're still building quite a few houses, but we're running out of space essentially. So it's kind of going into Greater Bristol. Um, and one of the great things is that is that Bristol uh, and the Greater Bristol region is a very attractive place for people to want to come and live. And we celebrate that because we think we're a fantastic place to live and work as well. Um, but we've got to manage the infrastructure impacts of that and alongside it, the carbon impact um, where we have um, you know, agreed um, at the city level that we're going to reach our net zero carbon targets. And so the issue for commuter traffic is really important because one of the things that we find, especially on the A4118, which comes from kind of Cribs Causeway, um, down through um, uh, past Hembury, um, in through Westbury on Trim, over the Downs, uh, and then into the city centre, um, that that gets particularly congested. Uh, but also for people coming from Porter's Head over the bridge um, on the M5 and then through down to the Portway. Um, uh, and then, of course, the M32, which is, well, half of it, oddly, is in my constituency. The other half is Coe McCarthy's so trying to be going north or south. But those three bits are points of congestion. Uh, for commuter traffic that are envisaged to get heavier in the future. Um, and so the conclusions we kind of came to in our North Bristol Transport Plan was that we wanted to see both of those tackled, but the priority had to be around clean public transport. Um, so people's preference were for um, um, uh, clean buses, and we've got a great example of biogas buses in the city where um, fuel is produced in Avermouth, um, which is, doesn't happen across all parts of the country. So we're quite lucky to have that facility um, in the city. Um, there's obviously discussions at a national level about hydrogen buses, but we're some way um, from that at the moment. Um, but the really interesting point from my perspective was the multimodal um, kind of demand from people. They, they didn't want to see a kind of random park and ride plonk here and a bus stop over here and a bit of a cycle lane here that didn't really connect to anything. Um, they actually want to see these things come together in what we call transport hubs. Uh, and so the proposals that we ended up then putting forward um, for sites like the new Henbury train station, um, for the expansion perhaps of the park and ride in Shirehampton, uh, for conversations on the Lockley side, or it's a little trickier over there, is that instead of um, making um, a kind of single use decision, let's bring together 
park and ride with clean bus technology, cycle lock up and hire, EV charging access points, uh, and make sure that there's connected um, cycle lanes um, that can bring you from the hubs into the centers of where you, uh, where you are. And we've had some success in, in doing that. The, the, the key point, I think, on, on how do you deliver these things is that it's always frightfully complicated and very long term. Uh, and I understand why that's frustrating for people. And you've got to go through all of these acronym based decision processes to try to get things business case approval for then further work to get done for them to fully get integrated. But we now know that we're going to um, have the rail connection line extended from Bristol Temple Meads uh, with a stop in Ashley Down at the airfield, which is obviously being developed into a new um, neighbourhood and down to Hembury. Um, we'd quite like that to be connected to the Avermouth side it's called the Hembury Loop so that you've got a loop that goes around the city. Um, uh, we know that there's going to be a bid for a park and ride um, at the Hembury site. Originally, um, it was on either side of the roundabout and you couldn't walk between the two. So we've suggested maybe it would be sensible to put it on the same place um, uh, so that people would use it. Um, and we started to see EV charging, for example, increase at the, um, uh, at the Shyampton Park and Ride as well. So we're slowly starting to see action coming forward. Um, a key priority for us, though, is that with the planning changes that are being put forward by the government, um, uh, we want to make sure that the funding allocations for infrastructure are not delayed. There's some concern that developers will be able to agree different funding allocations for infrastructure at later stages, and that councils may end up more on the hook at earlier stages when, at a time when they don't really have much cash for obvious reasons. And so um, uh, we've still got quite a lot of work to do, and we're expecting some primary legislation in the new calendar year where we're going to be talking about these um, uh, talking about these issues. And then for us, uh, you know, across Bristol in the west of England, we have uh, various tiers of government. Um, and the theory being, the reason I supported the idea of a regional mayor um, through the West England Combined Authority was that we'd have some uh, connection between the cities uh, and ideally bidding for a kind of uh, a more advanced transport authority. Um, unfortunately, that's not happened yet. Um, uh, there's an election coming up for the Metro Mayor next May, so people might wait to ask those questions uh, when that period comes up. Because to me, that ought to have been the number one um, priority. There are still some headaches. Again, I remember having to be part of a conversation where a bus lane was coming down one side of a dual carriageway on one side of a council boundary, and it was going up on the other side of the dual carriageway on the other one, so they, they wouldn't connect. Uh, on, and you just think, gosh, I mean, surely this can't be that complicated. Um, but the good news, and I think the good news for the purposes of our conversations today, um, is that uh, the majority of people that I speak to agree on all of this stuff. There's always contention about where you put bus lanes and turning restrictions and what it means that people have got driveways and all that type of stuff that you need to work through. But the best way to work through it, in my view, um, is by bringing people into the conversation. And we have to improve, in, in, my, in, in my view, how we do consultations on these issues. It can't just be you know, a sign up in the local library, um, not that we can really go there at the moment, and a kind of website portal that's open for 30 days because most people miss it. So I think we've got to be very proactive in talking about these things. And some of the advantages that Lindsay was talking about in her presentation, which I know some of my constituents on first glance would be like, oh, I don't know about that. But actually, when they thought about it and talked through it with people, I imagine they'd be quite supportive of some of these things. You can actually get to the right place. And that's partly my responsibility as a member of parliament, um, but it's also the responsibility of all, this, all of us to keep talking about um, these issues and the, and the positive benefit that can come from some of the changes that I know you've been talking about today. Um, I'll probably just leave it there if that's all right, Richard, but I'm happy to answer any questions that um, people have. Thank, thanks so, so much. Sorry about the phone that went off there. Right, Darren, there were a couple of questions that have come in that are specifically aimed at you. Um, one was, do you have any influence over WCA's joint local transport plan, which had some good initiatives? Um, and um, the other one was, um, how do you think that residents can persuade city leaders and councillors that they want to see active travel plans? So do you want to have a quick sure. go at either of those? Yeah, so the, the, key, the key thing on the WECA um, transport plan um, some of the things I mentioned actually had to come through that process. Um, so the kind of extra railway stations, the bids for parks and rides, and how you kind of bring those things together, um, at, at, which has been which has been good because actually it's extended my influence a little bit because some of these issues go beyond my boundaries. Um, but now I have more of a kind of role in feeding constituents views into this process. The one thing I would say though is that. Um, and I don't have any evidence of this as an assumption, so I might be wrong, but I don't think many people know what WECA is or what it does um, or who the mayor is or how to be involved in this conversation. Um, and so I do worry a little that these decisions kind of get 
you know, taken without people really being part of the conversation. And so again, we should probably, um, if people are interested in these issues, you know, encourage people to take a look and get involved in that record process because that's the main place really where it where it happens. Um, Richard has raised an interesting question there about new road building. Um, uh, unless you're building like a brand new town which needs a road to go through the middle, like perhaps to fill an airfield, I don't really see the need for new road building. To be honest, I think you can do much better by investing in better rail connectivity, which we're starting to expand. Um, and bus um, and bus dedicated routes actually ideally with cycle lanes um, attached to them and so I'm not really a supporter of road expansion just because I think it defeats the object um, uh, but there is a national road building fund um, from the government in Westminster um, which is kind of supporting some of these measures which I think is um, I think is unfortunate. Um, the issue on how do I um, how do how do residents persuade city leaders and councils they want to see active travel plans well the first thing I'd say is um, is talk to us um and um you know get in touch with your counselors either on email or zoom or facebook or whatever it is that, that you do um i mean in bristol i think we're pretty we're pretty sold unless anybody tells me otherwise i think marvin our mayor is um particularly sold on these issues and he's brought forward some of the decisions around the city center pedestrianization um which he wanted to do anyway but was uh, he's been able to do that quicker now which is good news um uh, and I think the councillors are sold on it as well. I think, from, you know, in my neck of the woods, so I go from the Downs all the way down to kind of Avermouth up to Henbury and Brentree and across the top um, down by the M32. Um, we're we're, we're going to be pretty lucky in terms of orbital travel. Um, not that they're going to fully connect, but there's going to be kind of into town and out orbital travel. The things that, um, that I'd like to see more of is the bits in the middle because people that live in the middle of these still find it difficult, especially if they're elderly or they have disabilities or they don't have a, an ability to get to the rail station to kind of make that connecting point. So we've got to fill in the gaps a bit. Um, and so if um, if you share that view, do talk to your councillors about it. Councillors have a funny role in Bristol these days because they don't have any um, executive power anymore. That all rests in the mayor. Um, so ultimately you've got to persuade Marvin, but the councillors can persuade Marvin. So just talk to everybody about it and I'm sure we'll figure it out. And then very lastly, just do you have any influence over transport for people with disabilities and bus passes? Is that part of your uh, a good question. So it's a good question. There's two there's two things there which I think are important. One is around community transport, which we often don't talk about. And we've got some great community transport providers uh, in my neck of the woods in Lawrence Western, for example, is one that springs to mind um, where they do get funded on a per ride basis to help local people get around. And they can be really, really valuable in the bits where it's hard to connect to other parts of the kind of community that you're trying to get to. But they are always constantly fighting for funding and support. And it's a bit of an uphill struggle. And it's only through the hard work and dedication, really, of volunteers that these things happen. So I would like to see an expansion of kind of more local community based transport options and supporting them to have clean vehicles as opposed to having to buy old diesel mini buses that they can get for cheap because they haven't got much money. Um, on bus passes, I, I mean, there's a big debate about what powers we ought to have locally around buses. We've obviously got first bus as our primary bus provider, and there's a debate about whether we ought to have um, more powers locally, whether through WECA or city mayors, um, in order to either bring forward competitors or to have more of a say over how budgets can be spent. We used to have more of a say around, um, uh, oh gosh, I forgot what it's called now. We had money for routes that weren't profitable. We could subsidize the routes and then persuade them to go into the different communities, which we don't have anymore because the government cut it for basically nothing. Uh, and I'm someone that supports the idea that we should really get some of these powers and budgets out of Westminster and deliver them locally, because ultimately we know where we need things to go and how we want them to go to meet local people's needs. Civil servants with the best will in the world would, would not really have a clue uh, in, in Whitehall. And then, sorry, one, literally one last one. Do sure. you believe the current administration uh, recognises the social justice issue behind transport? Uh, for instance, the mayor says that making it difficult for drivers uh, will affect the poorest in the city. So have you any comment on that? Yeah, I think this is, um, I think you're talking about Marvin, and I think you're talking about some of the debate about the clean air zone proposals, um, uh, where there was a study done to look at people's modes of transport um, and how they get around the city. And there was a particular problem that arose in parts of South Bristol, I think the lower parts of South Bristol, so kind of um, Hartcliff and uh, Withywood and those parts of the city, um, which have, you know, if you think I'm moaning, I mean, you know, they've chronically had poor public transport connections for decades. 
probably since they were created really uh, and so car ownership is again quite high in those parts of the city not least because um, sources of employment as well as leisure and stuff don't really um, exist there in the way they did before when you had for example you know more jobs in manufacturing and stuff so as a consequence people were driving in and out of town more the issue that Marvin was trying to deal with was if you and I know this is a problem for lots of people but if you were to ban kind of diesel vehicles um, uh, very quickly especially if people had bought newer diesel vehicles on the basis that the government uh, at the time had suggested that might be a good thing to do um, and they wouldn't be able to afford to get new vehicles because they're not in that position financially uh, you would essentially be kind of cutting off if you hadn't put the public transport connections in first people's ability to get in and out of the city um, so I don't think he was um, being pro car necessarily I think he was just trying to be equitable and just uh, in the way this thing is happening and um, I think that is really important. I mean, I, I, just very briefly, I launched the Citizens Assembly on Climate Change in the House of Commons a few weeks ago. I chair a select committee and we commissioned the work. Um, and a key principle that came through that was um, what we in the bubble call a just transition, although apparently no one had really heard of that, so we have to use better language. But the idea was that nobody is disproportionately affected by the transition to net zero. And I think that's really important. You know, if you live in uh, I don't know, Westbury Park in my constituency, it might be easy to get on your bike and cycle into town and do your shopping and cycle all the way back up the hill again. Um, but if you live in uh, Avonmouth, you know, actually that's a bit harder for people. And so you do have to try to do these things in the right way. OK, that's great. Thanks so much, Darren. Um, so if you want to stay on now, we're going to hand over without much ado to Tom. But um, if you want to stay with us, fine. If you need to dash, then we understand. And thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Thanks you. Thanks for Right, Tom. Uh, sorry, um, we, we obviously we've moved the part of the question and answer to that slot so that Darren can answer them. So, Tom, are you ready to go? Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks. Good afternoon. So, my name's Tom Swithinbank. I'm a volunteer with Bristol Psycho Campaign. So, just a little bit about the Psycho Campaign. Um, established in the 1980s, came out of the sort of launch of, of Sustrans and what was called Cycle Bag, um, and it's been been ticking along since since then. Uh, there's been uh, a bit of a growth in, in the last sort of uh, year, I suppose, which has been great, um, increasing people coming forward to, to volunteer, increasing engagement, lots more people using some of the skills that they have as a sort of day job, if you like, to, to help us with what we're doing. Um, there's a great deal of expertise in, in what works and what doesn't in terms of how the infrastructure is done, but I think there's a growing recognition that we need to push the agenda that, that cycling, active travel, all of that sort of thing is a, something that, that people want and, and push the influence on a political level. Um, so yeah, that's our, that's our sort of plan. Um, I'm trying to skip on, but it's not skipping on. Oh, oh I've gone too far. Sorry about that. I use this instead of the mouse. So, yeah, these are some of our sort of principles that we, we think we'd like to stand by. So we'd like to listen to the community. We'd like to, to put, provide honest critique to the, the council. Um, and we do meet with them to discuss what's what's working, what's not working so well in some of their plans. Um, yeah, and I think one thing we said we want to do more of in 2020 is celebrate when the council have done something well um, and praise them, praise them for that. You know, Bristol Bridge being a, being a prime example. Um, so here, these are our sort of asks generally. Um, obviously, it can get a lot more specific, but separated cycle lanes, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, policing of, of 20 miles an hour and road traffic offences and um, yeah as discussed by Darren cycling to interact with other modes. So this is just a little bit about what's happened sort of since Covid uh, you know kicked off in uh, early in the year. Um, as we know you know government asked us people to walk and cycle um, and you know public transport was is was and is running at reduced capacity with with people uh, wary of being on public transport, even if the capacity is there. Um, so we've seen some changes. Um, as I say, members of the cycle campaign met with 
the council to discuss some of the cycle routes which have been put in and fed back on some of you know, what, what could be done better and what could be tweaked. Um, but most of the most of the stuff is fairly uh, sort of city centre based um, and it's been quite easy, quite interesting to compare across the country what different councils are sort of committing to. It's easy obviously to put up a little map, but um, you know, some are, are more extensive than others. And um, in the top left hand corner there, Paris is is leading the way um, on you know a real shift to, to active travel and um, the, the mayor won a, a big big majority based on sort of backing that um, in her, her manifesto. So there was some emergency funding that was provided by the government, um, not a huge amount of funding, but the, the language was very different uh, that they came out with. So any proposed scheme that does not meaningfully alter the status quo on the road will not be funded. That was their big statement. And that was quite a shift from um, sort of the language that had been used before. And, and obviously means that, you know, uh, I don't know, putting in a, a painted cycle lane like you meet, might see in, in Stokes Croft down by Hamilton House, just, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't get funded because it doesn't really make any sort of meaningful contribution to, to getting people to cycling. Um, so yeah, Bristol, well, Wecker, sorry, was rewarded for an ambitious bid and, and got all, well, got 111% of the money it applied for. So that was great to see. And, and the next deadline for the next round was August the 7th. Um, we're still waiting on what's going to happen next with that. But uh, yeah, we've seen lots of people put in pop-up cycle lanes. Um, we are seeing some of these come out in some cities, which is, is really concerning. Um, and yeah, all coming down to sort of politics. Some have come out on the basis that there's too much congestion on the roads to keep them in. Um, you know, obviously some people might argue that the reason they're going in is because of the, the congestion. Um, this is what's happened in Bristol. Um, the, the blue the blue lines are the, are the new routes. We were still waiting to see whether anything will come from Victoria Street and uh, I don't know what's well, Wine Street, I suppose, along Broadmead. Um, but you know they do they do add a, a, a nice route for, for people to get um, in and out of town from certain certain directions. Um, the trickiest bits will always be the junctions. Um, most of the cycle lanes sort of don't take account of those at the moment, but the, the emergency funding was relatively um, sort of uh, small amounts of money for the, for the work. So the Bristol Cycle Campaign put forward some asks for some what we called access only streets at the time. So around the city. Um, so from sort of the shopping streets like your Clifton Village or your Cotton Hill to um, you know, maybe some other areas, Dean Lane, St. Luke's Road, Beaufort Road, that might be more residential. And the emergency funding that went in on the 7th of August included some of those, which was great. So included, um, included Cotton Hill, it included Beaufort Road. And um, yeah, we will see, we'll see, uh, you know, what happens when the government confirmed that the council has has received that funding. Hopefully, there'll be some consultation. Hopefully, it'll be done properly. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of you know anger around St Mark's Road, but the consultation really hasn't started there yet. Um, so, what's next? Um, this is what we're hoping for. Sort of more in 2020, the council to focus on is is really how to get large numbers of people in and out of of the city um, and. The, you know uh, which roads they can focus on. Um, this is a tool called Rapid Cycleway Prioritization, um, and the big blue lines are basically roads with space and um, I don't know a bigger algorithm to work out which roads are the most effective to to put uh, cycle lanes on. So you can see there Gloucester Road um, to the north and and moving out to the south as well there's some big opportunities so we'd like the council to take those those opportunities over the next couple of years um and just finally recently we've seen um this this document called gear change come out which is almost a sort of cycling and walking strategy um and this is going to set quite high standards and and the challenge i suppose will be to get Councils to meet those standards. Um, 
one thing that's, that's a sort of a big shift is is that protected or separated cycle lanes is now going to become sort of the the standard or the the, the baseline as opposed to being something quite aspirational um so and there is a, a threat that if standards are not high then funding can be withdrawn for other projects so whether bus projects or, or road building projects however we'll see whether the, there's sort of the the teeth to hold councils to uh, and developers to those standards um and then just a final little slide i suppose uh I guess it's up to us really as the sort of residents of Bristol to sort of push the, the councillors, the, the the Bristol City Council Mayor, the Wecker Mayor, and, and certainly with the elections coming next year to show them that we want active travel. Um, and there's always studies that say that, you know, a lot more people do than, than uh, maybe is perhaps realised in the media. So, and I, I think... From my own personal point of view, I think the key is probably the impact on children of not being able to, to cycle to school. Um, you can see there 2% in the UK, um, in, in the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, you know, up, you know, much, much, much higher. Um, you know, do I've put there, do parents enjoy having to get their kids to school? I think most parents would, in, in certainly in, in city centre Bristol or the city of Bristol would say that it is, is feasible their child probably to cycle a couple of miles to school once they're in secondary school but it's not safe enough at present and then yeah the social justice angle i think um, we touched on it at the start actually 40 percent of job seekers state a lack of transport is a key barrier to getting a job um something darren touched upon um but yeah i, I had a quick look while he was speaking bishport avenue to queen square is, is 4.7 miles it's a very cyclable journey um, most people could probably, you could pick up a bike for a uh, hundred pounds on a, on a secondhand bike. Um, but, you know, again, people don't feel safe enough. People perhaps don't feel like it's, it's a thing that they should, that, you know, that they would cycle. Maybe they aspire to own a car. We need to overcome all of those things. Um, and people in the lowest income groups are less likely to have a, a car. So, yeah, I think we need to sort of really push the, the, the Bristol mayor and the Wecker mayor that these are key things around children around social justice and almost move the argument away from sort of cycling versus cars or you know you know cycling's all, all well and good for wealthy people you know it's that sort of debate is is sort of distracts from the issues so yeah that says um Bristol cycle campaign is on all the usual social media and we yeah we meet um a couple of times a month just to discuss some of the issues that are happening and that's me thank you thanks thanks so so much tom um no uh, as we've gone through this um various people uh, various of our speakers have posted links and, and details what i'll do is i'll gather all those together and um i'll put those on our green wire and on our facebook so that people will be able to access so they know where to get more information about um about livable neighborhoods or bristol cycling or whatever okay so i'll share those i've got obviously a note of them so that's great um right so thanks as much for that um i will now uh, hand over to uh, chloe chloe are you ready to go i am i am can you hear me all right yes we can great okay. i've had to uh put my headphones in i've got some very um overexcited boys in my house and it's quite noisy at this end so I'm, I'm hoping that like this uh, they won't disturb you at your end. Um, so firstly huge thanks to um, Greenpeace Richard and Richard for um, inviting um, RRR City to be part of this event today. I'm really pleased to be um, able to join on, on behalf of the, the campaign um, to talk to you a little bit about where we're at. Um, I don't have a beautiful um, presentation to share with you. Um, RRR City la launched on um, National Clean Air Day last week. So we're really very much in the early stages of, um, of, of deciding what this, this campaign will be. Um, it's a partnership campaign. It's been initiated by XR Bristol's Movement of Movements Working Group. Um, I'm sure lots of people here are, are really familiar with the, the term and concept around movement of movements, but just um, in case that's not, that doesn't apply to everybody, 
Um, Movement of Movements is a, um, an initiative that has come around um, in response really to the climate emergency, acknowledging that there are very many um, brilliant active campaigning groups um, that are uh, using their own particular um, skills, strategies and focuses to draw attention to aspects of the climate and ecological emergency and really identifying a need that we have in this time of, of requiring action now for us all to find moments of, of solidarity and to be able to join our efforts together and, and push harder for um, action, for immediate action. So um, Movements of Movement doesn't, doesn't belong to anybody, it doesn't belong to XR, it's, it's collectively owned by anybody who um, is participating in a project that reaches out to other groups um, and, uh, and harnesses collective energy. So um, this, uh, our Air Our City is, um, is very much a, a campaign that's being designed um, in collaboration with community groups across the city. And where we're at at the moment is we've held two open forum meetings at which we've invited community groups from across the city to attend. Um, and we had across those two forums about 35 community groups joining us, um, representing all sorts of different um, areas of, of interest, um, including political parties, um, including um, health groups, um, community groups that, that represent children and young people, etc etc um, and um, what we essentially posed to to those groups was a series of questions um, around um, their concerns about the air quality in the city the changes that they wanted to see um, about how we could work together about the kind of measurable outcomes that we um, that we might be interested in in pursuing and about the kind of audiences that, that we're seeking to reach and we had two really, really energetic conversations um, uh, during those forum meetings um, that, that really dug into all of those questions. And from all of that information, we've pulled together a, a proposal for the campaign, um, which is centred around sort of three main principles. Um, it, it has to be a campaign that um, enables democratic decision making, um, that um, uh, allows all members to create and guide the campaign. It has to involve efficient and manageable decision-making structures and it has to absolutely enshrine the voices of those who are most impacted by um, poor air quality um, and air pollution across the city. So in order to achieve that what we've what we've sought to do is to bring together a steering group who represent the communities that are um, most affected the sort of constituencies across the city. That means that what we've not got is a steering group full of experts in policy or experts in transport or scientists. What we've drawn together at the moment is a steering group that involves um, representatives from Stop the Mangum Easy. Um, we've got representatives from the African Voices Forum, people from MEDACT, We've got um, a teacher from Cotton Garden Primary School who are doing really brilliant work with their climate curriculum. Um, we've got representatives from Extinction Rebellion Youth and from Youth Strike for Climate and XR is also represented as one of the partners on the campaign. We recognise that we're not yet representing all the groups that we would like to see participating in the steering group so we're continuing to have conversations that look to, to bring additional voices into that. In particular, we're really aware that, that we haven't got the voices of communities in, in Barton Hill or in Lawrence Hill involved on that steering group at the moment. And we know that they are the communities that are, um, you know, according to the statistics, suffering the worst air quality. So we're still, we're still building that group. And um, the, the plan is now to, to start with that team looking at what our strengths and weaknesses are as a campaign and to think about um, the audiences that we want to reach and the kind of action that we want to, to press for. So um, obviously the, the context of today's meeting is about transport and I'm sure that will be a major focus of our, of our campaign and, and where we seek to, um, to draw attention and to hopefully push for action. But I think there will be other things that come into it as well. I think we will we'll probably be looking at... Um, waste management in the city. I suspect we'll probably be looking at um, you know, other sources of particulates. Um, 
But um, as I say, those aren't my decisions to make. Those are, will be the collective decisions of the steering group. And as we, we come together and, and, um, and continue these discussions, we'll, we'll find out more about exactly what it is that we want the group um, to, to be. But one of the things, one of the opportunities I'd really like to take from being um, part of this conversation today is to say that um, we are really, really open to building really strong partnerships with other organisations across the city that are um, seeking similar kinds of, of outcomes to, to the ones that we're looking for, um, which is just ov overall improvement of our air quality, of course. Um, and we're also looking to, to make sure that we're um, spreading out our um, uh, engagement into community groups. So if anybody here today um, thinks that they would like to um, help us make some of those connections, then that, that would be incredibly welcome. Um, and uh, you know, I really look forward to, to keeping everyone um, informed as to, to what, what the campaign grows into and, and how it moves forward. Um, I think that's probably all that um, I need to say at this point and be really happy to, um, to have further discussion and conversations. Sorry, thanks so, so much, Chloe. Um, if you'd like to post uh, a link uh, or a contact details, uh, either privately to me or, or in the group, so that I can include that when I, I put the, um, the, the, the thing up on Greenwire and on our Facebook page. Um, right, so now I'm going to go quickly through some of the questions that have been popping up. Thanks to all of our speakers who've spoken, and um, we've got about 20 minutes now to for up to 20 minutes for sort of questions. So I'll quickly go through and there's, a, there's one that was posted early on that was just saying that electric vehicle, uh, sorry, we're talking a lot about types of vehicles and motorbikes and scooters and electric motorbikes and scooters weren't, don't seem to be included in the conversation. Although I do know that there are um, plug-in motorcycle electric motorcycle grants and things available. So I think that government policy does does include um, a move for all vehicles away from fossil fuels to electric by a date, and that would presumably include motorbikes and uh, scooters. Um, so I don't know whether anyone who, maybe Tom or one of the others, has got any comment about the electric scooters that are appearing in some cities, whether that you see that as a positive move or not. Any comments there before we move on to the next question? I don't know enough about uh, about electric scooters, to be honest. We're discussing as a camp cycle campaign whether we want to put out a uh, you know a statement or a web post about them. Um, I guess the only thing I'd say from a personal point of view is they don't do anything for inactivity. Um, right. um, you know, if someone doesn't do anything to solve the, the huge inactivity, obesity sort of crisis we have as a country. Um, so yeah, it would be a shame, I guess, if people started to use them over over cycling or walking. And um, but yeah, other than that, I don't know. I don't know okay. anything about them really. Thanks. Um, we had a two or three questions, which I think can all come down to the same broad question. Um, which was about access to areas where you're talking about the uh, livable neighbourhoods, where you're trying to reduce through traffic. What about, first of all, people who live there who need to you know, park on their driveway and also people with disabilities or limited mobility who uh, require vehicles? So, uh, Lindsay, do you want... Oh, and, and, and then there was also a comment from Ellie about the fact that she was involved with playing out and she said their model was better for parking, walking, cycling. I'm not quite sure what the difference between the two models are. I might ask, unless you know, in which case, sure. anyway, Lindsay, you first. Sure. And I'm really glad people are asking those questions because I was kicking myself after that I didn't uh, I didn't uh, wasn't clear on this point. Uh, the beauty of the livable neighbourhood approach is that all access is retained and all parking is retained. Everybody who can currently drive and park outside their house can do. Uh, the modal filters go in basically that you wouldn't have like a, a road and you'd have a modal filter one end, a modal filter at the other and nobody could drive or park in between. Uh, people can always get in or out. It's more like a kind of cul-de-sac uh, concept. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, on disabilities, I would say that, um, that it's not on my 
point as a non-disabled person uh, on behalf of the campaign to say whether uh, how it would affect people who are disabled. And I think that uh, anybody who's saying uh, what about the disabled should uh, allow the disa uh, disabled people a voice to give their own point of view on it in terms of their own access. I would only say that uh, no access is removed, so everybody is still able to do everything they're able to do. And also that disabled people are uh, disproportionately affected by traffic. Uh, and are therefore going to be potentially disproportionately enabled by the uh, by this uh, way of doing things. Things like being making it easier and safer to cross roads, able to use mobility scooters, wheelchairs, things like that. So uh, yeah, that's 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 where I will talk. Uh, leave that. Um, and then Ellie can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but. Uh, just to be clear on the difference between what we're asking for and what playing out is about. So playing out is about uh, for a short amount of time on a weekly or monthly basis, uh, having a, a play street where you effectively close the street but still allow access for people to drive through but in a, a moderated way with uh, people mo making sure that that's safe. Uh, and allowing children basically free run of the street to do whatever they like and, and play and, and have fun like a lot of us experienced when, when we were little. Uh, whereas what we're asking for is a permanent solution. Uh, not exactly a permanent play street because people will still be able to train, uh, drive through, but uh, drive to their houses, but changing the culture of the streets so that children uh, feel safe and parents feel safe letting their kids go out and play because that street is for people, it's not for cars. Uh, was that about right, Ellie? Yeah, and Ellie's in fact posted to confirm what you just said about how um, the playing out works with closing the street for three hours per week or whatever. Um, we had a question about combining active transport and public transport, and I wonder whether Tom has got any thoughts on that, and especially whether the changing gear addresses that at all, because um, obviously you know, you're getting to a point where a number of people are saying they'd like to be able to do cycle, but also go by public transport and then cycle at the other end. And at the moment, we know that space on buses and trains is very limited. Tom? Um, yeah, I think this is key. I think um, I think it's key that uh, the, the right um, place to, to put your bike at each end is, is really important, I think. And... Um, there's, a, there's an excellent campaign launched um, called Cycling Works in Bristol, which is, is asking uh, major employers or employers to sort of put their name behind and, and ask for, for better cycling routes, but also for, for locations for people to put their bikes, perhaps, say, at the, the park and ride sites um, that exist and new park and, park and ride sites so that people can, can put, maybe park their bike park their car and jump on a bike and um and leave their bike there there overnight um and yeah we've also been working with network rail um talking about the new bike parking at um at temple meads which has been moved out from the the station platform to uh to to uh, somewhere on the friary and um although you know it, it holds a lot of bikes and that's great uh, some people have described it as a sort of bike thief buffet um, you know, just all those bikes sitting there, um, you know, in the in the dark. So yeah, I think it's really important that that the right places to put your bike are at each end, so that people can use their bike and maybe leave it and uh, and, and get back on the bus to to go head on their journey further. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, we've got things coming into the chat box and. Um... Gavin has shared with us some thoughts um, and he's uh, saying more residents only parking and a workplace parking levy that I know is something that's been talked about. Um, uh, there was a question that came in about how we go about lobbying and how we go about getting the government to um, spend more money on, on, um, on you know, active, active transport, uh, you know, and... Um, not investing in roads. How do we get uh, the people in power to change? Um, and I, I don't know whether anyone, I don't know who wants to try and answer that one. I mean, we all know we have to keep lobbying. Oh, Richard, do you want to have a go at that one? I, I suppose that's the, the, the whole idea of having all these meetings up and down the country 
is, is part of our transport campaign for Greenpeace, is to get that reallocation of money uh, that the Chancellor has put aside for major road building projects up and down the country and share it out amongst the lo uh, local communities. Um, and if you do look, I have actually posted um, a link to our Green Recovery How Do We Get There document, which is 64 pages long. So if you were thinking, um, you know, what is Greenpeace actually wanting to do, then have a look at that document. Um, rightly or wrongly, this was co controversial when I mentioned it in, in Bath, but the money allocated for H HS2, um, Greenpeace is not seeing that as value for money, and we would rather that be spent in local communities, transforming streets, making transport affordable um, and accessible to as many people as possible. Um, and, um, and, and so that's, there's gonna be a lot of lobbying at a national level. So um, if there are groups that could support uh, our campaign to, 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 to actually influence the chancellor, and I have seen there's, there's one or two other initiatives. Um, I think there's is it a change for better transport uh, has been coming up in my inbox a couple of times this week. Um, so yeah, that's, that's something, but obviously yes, your local councillors uh, and your MPs will also have levers to pull as well. Um, and we can't overlook Weka, which is the West of England combined authority, which nobody knows about, but they do have a lot of um, money to spend on local initiatives. And again, we need to make sure that that is well spent um, for the benefit of the communities here. Okay, thanks, Richard. Um, one of the other questions that came in was a question about the cost of public transport, and especially for um, those with, um, you know, the lowest paid or those with uh, disabilities and that. And one of the things that Greenpeace has been, as part of our national campaign, one of the things that where we've costed it out, we said Greenpeace is calling for at least 10 billion a year additional public money on sustainable transport. And part of that was to provide free public transport for people on the lowest incomes. So we are, you know, that is something that we would want to see. And we are mindful of the fact that, as, as Ollie said in, in his presentation, um, you know, whilst the cost of fuel for private cars has not increased, rail and um, rail and bus fares have gone up out of all proportion, really. So there's a mismatch there that needs to be addressed. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm just quickly going through these questions here to see whether I've um, missed any. Um, I'm not, I think that was that was the bulk of them. People have been putting some links, which I'll try and gather up. Um, and also, um, uh, Ollie has shared with us two links. One was a way of contacting your local MP about particular local schemes that you'd like to see. So uh, ways you can improve local transport. And then the other one is the Greenpeace National Campaign, which is there to support these aims that we're pressing for, which is to... Um, try and get the government to stop spending just all of their money on new roads. Um, you know, they're looking at spending like 27 billion, as Ollie said, on new road building and only a couple of billion on, on all of the other things that we've all been talking about today. Um, Richard and Ollie have been monitoring the questions as well. Have I missed any there? Uh, yes, Chloe actually asks, um, she wants thoughts from various perspectives represented here um, to the, the idea of a Bristol underground plan uh, that the mayor keeps on talking about. Um, I know I've got my own thoughts. I'm not sure whether Tom or... <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, I guess. I guess, um, again, we haven't, uh, you know, put a, a, a cycle campaign you know, statement out as far as I know it, um, but... Yeah, my own thoughts are that, um, yeah, I guess I'm kind of surprised in a way that, you know, it's still been talked about at such a sort of a serious level. And, um, you know, I've seen it noted in, in one of the Labour candidates for the Weka um, uh, mayoral post for next year again. And, and yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of money that, that they're talking about. And, um, 
Yeah, uh, as I think cycle campaigners and, and people that advocate for that sort of thing would always say that that sort of money could could transform the, the West of England in terms of walking and cycling and getting people getting people doing exercise without even thinking about it by by just sort of walking or electric biking you know people electric biking in from from Hartcliffe into the the city center is a lot better for our for their health than it is if they got on a a, a tube um or whatever he, he is proposing so yeah I guess that would always be my my case so I think sometimes the the numbers that you hear around mass transit and road building are, are just sort of taken for granted at some some level as you know 300 million here you know for you know and, and and I guess what they could do for cycling and walking is is massive okay thanks um just we're getting towards the time now one of the things that Greenpeace have asked that we might do which would be nice would be to take a screenshot of everyone I mean a few people have dropped out but most people are still here it'd be splendid if you wouldn't mind if you'd turn your camera on if you've been hiding yourself away so that I could get just a screenshot of the people who are with us today that would be lovely um hi hi and then the other thing is that something I, Mark, and you put your hand up, Mark. Could you type your question in the box and then I'll share it with everyone, Mark Usher. Type your question in the box and then I'll share it with. Um, but one thing, just a question that I'd like to ask, because it's one that, and I'll ask it kind of to Tom and, and Lindsay, is one of the biggest challenges for increased cycling is that although men feel more confident cycling in the current environment, um, women and children less, much less so, much less women cycle than men. Is that purely down to needing safer routes? Is that is that the the answer here? Lindsay first, and then Mark and Tom maybe. I'll have a go, but um, although I've seen the stats, I'm a little bit fuzzy on it. I think safety is the number one thing that uh, women tend to mention. Uh, when asked, why don't you travel by bike? Um, I will say that anecdotally, what I've seen coming out of the London low traffic neighbourhoods, which is the different name for livable neighbourhoods that have been emergency put in, is that uh, people who are there are seeing a huge increase in the amount of women and children that they're seeing cycling around. Uh, so uh, as the streets are perceived to be safer, I mean, cycling is still actually a very safe way to travel. It's uh, actually safer per mile than walking, uh, but it's not perceived to be that safe. So uh, where people feel safe uh, and able to, to get on their bike, uh, they do. It's that classic build it and they will come. Uh, you, you provide safe infrastructure uh, for, for women and for children and they will get on their bikes and they will cycle because we want to. Okay. Tom, you, I mean, I guess you. Yeah, I think I would, I think I'd echo that. I think there's often uh, sort of meetings and documents and things talking about, you know, other various things that, that prevent all sorts of demographics from cycling, but um, yeah, hills being one of them in Bristol. Um, but yeah, I'd say if you, if you build stuff, then, then a, a huge number of people will get on their bikes. And I think as well, there's a sort of uh, snowball effect that if it becomes more normal for women or more normal for, for you know, a Somali parent from Barton Hill to cycle, then that just keeps increasing the sort of uh, the process. Um, but yeah. Okay. Right. Um, Ollie's going to, uh, Ollie's going to take a screenshot. So if we can all smile for Ollie, he's going to take a screenshot. Hang on a minute. There we hang go. on, hang on, get ready. Three, two, one. Cheese. Or should I say vegan cheese? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, have we got any last minute? Uh, I don't know if I missed any questions, Richard or Ollie. Um, I mean, I, I suppose as well as the... Uh, the, the, the underground idea tram systems have, have been around for some time. I remember when I, I mean, I've been living in Bristol for 25 years and when I arrived here, a tram system uh, going from basically uh, from um, 
the train station to the bus station up Gloucester Road to Abbey Wood and then across to Cribs Causeway was was mooted and it was shelved because uh, of money and yet um, you just think in hindsight if they had invested uh, and been bold with that I think that would have solved quite a lot of our problems. Um, so trams is an alternative yeah and I know Bristol is actually going to be um, experimenting with e-scooters um, uh, as, as a mode of transport but you have to rent them to make them legal um, so that'd be something to, to look out for. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I fired a, two of those th three questions at Tom and Lindsay. Chloe, did you have anything that you wanted to add just as a last thought on any of those things? No, thank you no. for asking, okay. but it's, it's been okay. a really brilliant learning experience for me actually taking on an awful lot of information, which I'll take back to the campaign. So thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Um, so we are pretty much um, at time. Um, i said that we'd try and end uh, four, which we have done. Uh, huge thanks to uh, our speakers, to Lindsay, to Darren Jones, who's now left us, to Tom and to Chloe. Thanks ever so much. Thank you all of you for giving up uh, uh, to an hour and a half or for the speakers, a couple of hours of their uh, Saturday afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, I've learned a lot and I hope that uh, you have and uh, I hope by getting those links in that that we'll start to make some connections individually and maybe as groups as well so I will gather those those various links so that if you want to know more about any of the, the, the groups that have been represented today I'll make sure that we put those on our Greenpeace Facebook and uh, on our Greenwire so that you can do that okay so that's pretty much four o'clock thank you very much for um for sharing the afternoon with us. And um, we'll, uh, you know, we must do it again sometime. <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much. Thank Can you. I thank you, Richard, for facilitating and keeping us all to time, etc. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, all the speakers. Right. Okay, bye thank all. You. Cheerio. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye all. Bye. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Rima. See ya. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Rima. Thanks for joining us. Right. Right. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone. I'll end end the meeting now. Okay.